good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. You know people are joining from different time zones and we will try to have these meetings in different parts of the day for the next meeting so that we can accommodate all the different regions. Uh, so thank you very much for everybody to join us at this first meeting of the UNESCO Working Group on Open Science Monitoring Framework. We are very happy to have you here with us. We are starting this conversation on monitoring, which is probably one of the most important discussions that we need to have uh, in the context of the implementation of the UNESCO recommendation on open science and also in the context of operationalizing open science more, more broadly. So just a few uh, housekeeping uh, um, in messages for the beginning. If you could please mute your microphones while uh, you are not uh, speaking and switch your camera off so that we can have a good connection for everybody. Uh, if you have any questions or inputs, please don't hesitate to share it in the chat box. We are looking at the chat box and we are also going to be collecting both questions, information, anything that you post in, in the chat box. Um, if you need to raise your hand to ask for the floor, of course, you, you, you raise your um, virtual hand. Uh, and then uh, this, this session will be recorded and I hope that is okay for everybody um, here on the call. So um, I, I will start right away with some background information. We have two hours for this meeting. Of course, if we, if we manage to finish a little bit earlier, we can do that. The discussions will continue in the next uh, meetings of the working group. But I would like to start right away with a little bit of background for those who are uh, only joining this, this meeting for the first time, the meetings of the working groups for the first time. And I apologize to those who have already heard this part of the presentation. So just to remind everybody, put a little bit of context, um, the UNESCO recommendation on open science has been adopted by 193 member states of UNESCO during the general conference. Uh, in November last year, and it um, is a first international normative instrument on open science. It has been developed through a very consultative, um, inclusive process. We are hoping that the recommendation captures the voices of different actors of open science and also reflects on the different views on open science from the different regions. So for the first time, we have an international instrument that actually has an internationally agreed definition of open science. It spells out some consensus core values and guiding principles, and it addresses the multiple actors and stakeholders of open science. Another thing with the UNESCO recommendation is that it really uh, sets out, recommends actions at different levels to operationalize the principles of open science. And it also proposes some innovative approaches for open science at different stages of the scientific cycle. And it calls for development of a comprehensive open science monitoring framework. And that in particular is the reason why we are here today. So just to go back very quickly on the definition of open science as it is in the, uh, in the recommendation. So open science is defined as a set of different initiatives and processes that make scientific knowledge openly available, accessible, reusable for everyone, that increase scientific collaborations and sharing of information for the benefits of society and for the benefits of science, and that opens the process of scientific knowledge creation, evaluation, and communication to societal actors beyond the traditional scientific community. So we are talking opening science to scientists and opening science beyond scientific community to the broader society. We have identified in the recommendation, again, thanks to the inputs from different actors and different regions, four main pillars, open scientific knowledge with open access, open research data, open educational resources, software and hardware. Then open science infrastructures, both physical and digital, open engagement of societal actors through participatory science, voluntary science, or scientific volunteering, citizen science, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, and other engagement uh, mechanisms for opening this, um, um, for open engagement with societal actors, and then open dialogue with other knowledge systems. Uh, the recommendation has some key action areas that go from promoting an, a common understanding of open science 
developing an enabling policy environment, investing in infrastructures and services on open science, investment, of course, in capacity building, training, education, digital literacy, fostering a culture of open science, aligning incentives for open science, promoting innovative approaches for the entirety of the scientific process, and then promoting international multi-stakeholder cooperation. Of course, under each of these areas of action, there are several actions that are stated for different actors. So here now we are at the stage of implementation. As I said, the recommendation was adopted in November last year. And since November, we are looking into how to help our member states and how to help the different act actors get their head around a little bit the recommendation and then also implement the different provisions of it. And we have during the consultation processes um, understood that there are like five key areas of, of, of challenges that are critical for, for the implementation of open science. It is the change in conventional and scientific culture, a human and a building of human and institutional capacity. There is still a lot of capacity building in open science that needs to happen. There is need for adequate infrastructures, including reliable internet connectivity, something not to be forgotten while talking about open science broadly across uh, the world. The need to align incentives and revise criteria for evaluation of scientific excellence and careers, and, and the need to address the unintended negative consequences of open science practices. And to kind of address all of these challenges, there are several impact areas, we call them, capacity building policies, financing incentives, infrastructure, and monitoring. And these are the five working groups that we have set up to help us tease out some of these issues that are critical for the implementation of the recommendation. And we will be looking in particular into monitoring today. So as I said, the different working groups, and some of you are part of, of more than one uh, working group, and thank you for that. The one that we are uh, here for today is the one on open science monitoring framework with the main deliverable for this group is the creation of a global monitoring framework for open for open science. As I said, the objective of the working group in particular, it's, it's, it's really quite straightforward, is to assist us, the Secretariat, in the development of a monitoring framework for the UNESCO recommendation on open science. Of course, there is difference between monitoring open science and monitoring the implementation of UNESCO recommendation. But throughout our meetings and throughout our discussions, we are going to have to kind of work on both in parallel and then try to see how to align one to another. Because our task, of course, is to provide the mem member states with a framework within which they can report back on the way they monitor the implementation of open science recommendation while monitoring, of course, nationally uh, progress of open science more broadly. And our deadline for this uh, monitoring framework is June 2023. So we kind of have time, but believe me, it goes very fast. And then there is a, a series of processes and consultations that we would like to have so that uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's good that we start talking about this right now. So just very briefly to say, you know, who are the members of the, the Open Science Working Group? All of these working groups are completely open. Everything is online. Whoever wants to join at whatever point in time, whatever moment can join, just, you know, um, um, sends an email or, uh, or registers directly uh, for the meetings. This particular um, meet, uh, group uh, is very multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder. We have more than 100 registered. We have now, I see, 68 uh, participants, which is a, a pretty good number uh, to talk about monitoring from 38 countries and from all the regions in terms of the ones that are registered. And we see a nice repartition of different actors in the working group from universities and research institutes, um, PhD candidates to research directors, international regional thematic open science in initiatives, their representatives. There are people from ministries in charge of science from different countries, associations of universities, scientific unions, data organizations, publishers, librarians, research funders, uh, a few science journalists that have registered our UNESCO centers and chairs, permanent delegations to UNESCO national commissions, and some other relevant organizations. So, Again, thank you all for being here with us. It's really important for us that these working groups 
are diverse like this so that we can learn a little bit from each other and understand what are the different challenges that different you know parts of the whole open science puzzle and system are are having um and as i said the key the key object objective of this working group is to come up with a, a global monitoring framework for the implementation of the unesco recommendation in open science um a little bit about how we are going to go through this hour uh, and a half, two hours that we are going to be together. Um, starting from now, <laughs> we will go into looking into some existing monitoring frameworks for open science. We are very happy to have Natalia Manola of Open Air and Thomas Nedermark from the Commission to tell us a little bit more about the monitoring frameworks uh, that they are involved with. We also, I hope, have um, Lauren Kadevaller from PLOS, who will be saying just a few words about the indicate, Open Science Indicators Project at PLOS to see a little bit how they are looking into um, Open Science Indicators from their perspective. And then we have this presentation from um, uh, Ismael Garcia, who is the UNESCO Chair on Diversity and Inclusion in Global Science from the Leiden University. We ask him a, a, a bit of a difficult task to, to give us maybe some an overview of what we really have to think about when we are developing a global monitoring for open science and what the challenges are and how possibly we can address those challenges. Um, after these presentations on the existing monitoring framework and the thinking of where a monitoring framework, global monitoring framework should go, we can have a little discussion, um, question and answer with the speakers. We will then tell you a few words about what is in the UNESCO recommendation on open science with regards to the monitoring, what the, the, what the provisions are. We'll have a discussion on global monitoring framework for open science, open discussion. Uh, get, 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 we are very interested in your feedback, how you feel about it, what you think should be in there. And then we'll say a few words about next steps and we will close the meeting. So again, I would really like to thank everybody connected um, uh, for, for being with us. Your inputs are, are really very, very important. And without further ado, maybe I am going to pass the floor to Natalia to take us through a little bit what open air is doing in terms of monitoring for open science so i'm going to stop sharing my screen natalia i'm going to give it uh give it okay. to you uh, and please um feel free to okay. well, let me see uh can you see my screen no i'm sharing yes. the screen Perfect. okay good great Okay, so I will start, you know, we go very uh, fast over my slides because of the, of the time limit and the, and, and, the, and the room for discussion. So I think, you know, this is a very challenging uh, task. Uh, and it's great that UNESCO is, is, is overseeing and bringing the consensus, not only within Europe, but also, you know, with regions around the world. So this is, this is really great. I will be presenting what we are doing in open air. Uh, and I think what, what we have been doing is just, just touching upon some of the aspects. And uh, this is where, uh, again, we need to work together. So what we have created is the Open Science Observatory. You can see the link here. And what it is in a nutshell, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, in a nutshell, this is about you know, a service that we need in order to understand ourselves about to have a better understanding of the European open research landscape, to track trends, you know, because these, these are, are, are very useful to policymakers, uh, to see where we are doing you know, well, what, what we are not doing well, and how can we help in our decision making. So this is, this is, this is how it started. Uh, oops. Let me see. I'm trying to. OK, now, OK, so why do we need that? OK, so better understand the European open landscape. You know, what does it mean? So on one hand, we have the policies and then we have the uptake and implementation. So this is this is really not, you know, this is really crucial because many, at least in Europe, we, we, we see so many policies, but, you know, it's not, there is not an easy way to see, you know, what is their uptake and where we could uh, have intervention points. Uh, so we need to understand, this is why the impact pathways along many uh, dimensions, 
see what works, what would, doesn't work, and then to promote the good practices. And this is, you know, for us, what we are doing here, it's, it's part of our contribution to the European Open Science Cloud and now to the UNESCO monitoring. How are we doing it? So for us, it's all about open data and it's all about collaboration. So uh, the, the key things here is completeness, inclusion, transparency, or applicability. We don't want to do something that, you know, it's by, you know, by one organization uh, for its members, but we want to work with everyone in order to make sure that uh, whatever we produce has, uh, has an impact. So based on the open air research graph, this is our starting point because this is about you know data and how how we crunch the data in order to um, uh, in order to get the, these the, the statistics and and metrics. Uh, data that goes beyond publications, it goes mainly to research outcomes, uh, somewhat to collaborations, but not many. You know, in we are missing some of the facets that Anna said. Uh, second is based on open science principles, which means, you know, open data sources, open APIs, well-documented metrics and indicators, which is something that we believe should be there from day one. And then uh, the relevance for the community. So we are building indicators, and this is where UNESCO and, and your effort comes in, is, you know, what is relevant and what is not relevant. And I will go, you know, further, you know, I will say just that uh, the open science monitor, uh, have has different facets and it may be you know we may be looking at different indicators when we talk at the global level at the national level at the founder level or at the institutional level so this is something that we have to keep in mind uh, our methodological approach in a nutshell i will not go on it but you know uh, i will just pinpoint the main things is openness and transparency as i said coverage and accuracy because it's data and it's it's all the different facets of open science that we want to, to, to capture. It's not just open access, it's open science. So clarity and repl re replicability. So when we have a stat number now, is it gonna be the same or you know we're gonna see the trend uh, next year? Readiness and timeliness. So what we need is to realize that you know uh, even uh, we have the best data sources out there we need to get you know more uh, things coming and then last but not least is the quality it's the trust and robustness you know do we have uh, do we place our trust in the numbers and this is something that machines will do the you know the beginning but then we have to have the community we need to have our networks in order to make sure that uh, that uh, that we build this uh, trust and robustness into the monitoring uh, just to give you an idea of how we're doing it in open air so this is you know this is an open air graph it has a huge uh, it, it has a huge um, outreach all over the world so we are combining data from more than 10K resources. Then we have a big data AI driven infrastructure to extract information. And then we have a community to develop indicators and validate the data. So I think, you know, uh, what we need to focus our discussion now is on, on point three, because, you know, point three will give us, you know, uh, a pathway back to how we do one and two. So uh, mainly on the open air monitor uh, is, uh, or the open science observatory that we have is even though the open air um, graph has a global uh, coverage, we feel more confident to have the open science observatory for Europe now, for the reason is because we have our network and members who can go in and look into this um, country and, 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 and get, you know, curation and, you know, tell us what we're doing wrong, what we're not doing uh, uh, right, uh, in order to, to make sure that, you know, the indicators are correct. Uh, what are we doing now? So I've seen, I've, I've set up there open science practices, uptake and impact. And the impact, if you see, it's in grade because, you know, this is something that we are working on and this is something that we need to work on, uh, but we're not there yet. So it's indicators to track and evaluate progress. Uh, and then um, the characteristics is that, you know, we want, you know, this dashboard and visualization because, you know, it's just a bunch of numbers may not uh, say something to, to people, but perhaps they need to compare, they need to export into their own um, uh, systems and to, to, to process. And then uh, the Open Science Observatory is mainly, um, is mainly, uh, mainly targets the national approach 
because as I said before, the funders and institutions have different needs, so they have more detailed indicators, and this is where we have um, uh, we have our uh, our other on demand dashboards. So, going to the basic indicator framework that we work, it's it's something very simple. So we said one facet is the practice and uptake. Let's get the numbers, you know, crunch the numbers like open access sources, outputs, fair metrics. This is just something you know simple to do if you have you know the power of the graph uh, of the open air research graph then what we need to do is to understand the uptake and uh, dynamics of the system so who is doing what you know where do the costs where are the costs how can we uh, complement you know into these uh, trans uh, agreements which are the networks that we see that they are being um, that they are being formed. So this is for us, it's and for our network and for, you know, I think for everyone in Europe, these are indicators, not on the uptake, but just on, you know, deep, you know, more deeper indicators. And then uh, on the third level, which is again, you know, the, the most, um, the most uh, tough is to say the impact. So what we're doing is we, we have some effort in order to do uh, the usage, the citation, the usage by non-academia, the increased collaboration due to open science, and of course the SDGs. This is something that we have um, started to work uh, since this year, and now um, uh, with, a, with, with the support of the European Commission, we have a new project called PATHOS, so we will be disseminating more, and PATHOS, we will um, mainly um, uh, target this, uh, this impact. So, if, if what we have is we are trying to get you know something very concrete very practical very um to the point so if you see this the we have this indicator themes we have on one part the input and the funding then we have the research output we have open science so this is where uh this is where we need to 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 to, to delve in and then the networks collaboration and impact what I would like to say with this theme is that we use them in our monitoring, all of our monitoring within open air. But what I would like to say is that the open science indicators cannot come in a vacuum. Uh, they cannot come in a vacuum without having the funding on the research output and especially the knowledge on the policies, especially when we start comparing countries or institutions. You cannot compare the indicators of the implementation, for example, unless you know that there is a policy, that there is some funding uh, uh, put into the open, uh, open, open science. This is this is something that when we are just you know getting these numbers out, we need to think of of ways of how to present it. Uh, some indicators for open science in more detail is uh, we talk about fairness principles, uh, we talk about, so this is the RDA uh, maturity working group that we're working on, but we having, you know, realizing that these fair indicators are not the same across all disciplines, so this is something that we need to, to take into account. The openness metrics, journal business models, plan mass compatibility, and APS. These are all related to how open science is implemented and what is and and how how the environment is being set. Uh, and then, of course, we can have composite indicators, and this is something that we need to think because you know we we go from numbers to statistics slash metrics and then to indicators. So this is where. This is where we need to, you know, first of all, to clarify the terminology because many people are talking about statistics, other about metrics, other about indicators. So this is something that uh, we feel that um, the UNESCO working group uh, should uh, should um, somehow uh, take into account. Then, when we have the indicators, we need to break down because why do we need to break down by fields of interest, for example, like uh, time series, countries, data sources, institutions, funders, and so forth? Why? Because you know this is this this will give us a more a more a more in depth analysis of where we can have interventions. Because again, I don't think you know. The, the message that we have to the world is not to have an open science monitor just to monitor and track and to penalize, but to have an open science monitor so that we can identify the, 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 the shortcomings or the advantages and to learn from each other and, and see how some that, that goes. So the 
takeaways, and I think, you know, uh, trying to keep on, on my time is what to have in mind is when we are using such approach is that data quality is, is of, of key importance. Then what we need to, to see is that any monitoring uh, will have different levels of interest because it's going to be used by different um, groups of, uh, of actors and stakeholders. Uh, we need to align indicators with clear definitions, and this is where this group comes into. And last but not least is the community validation. So the community validation and the community engagement is very important. And what we need to see is if we have a framework that we understand that we, you know, with the understanding that all, not everyone needs to follow the exact, you know, framework like a, like a, um, like a Bible. It should be guidelines on how to to take it into their own country, into their constituency, uh, and. At the end is even though, you know, even though I believe that we have a, a, a very nice um, service to work with is that I think, you know, we have, you know, at some point what I'm claiming is, and I'm complaining to our team, is that we have too many indicators. So the, the, the way that I would urge us to, to do it, so in, in order to have an impact and an effect is to try to keep it simple, you know, simple indicators, with you know what is the the basic things that we do what is the more advanced and how we can delve in, you know into into more into more uh, into more aspects uh and by saying that i think is that we would be expecting you know some countries to 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 be you know the more mature kind of countries in the open science is to is to to get this going and what I would also be expecting is that other countries who are now setting up their policies is to have what what to expect and to try to embed this in the monitoring procedure within to the within their um, within their um, uh, workflows, and I think this is what I had to say. Thank you very, very much, uh, Natalia. This was very useful uh, and a very good overview of where you are with your thinking about what the challenges are and what can be done better. Uh, and, and I do hope that we will be able to, to follow up on some of your suggestions. Uh, of course, keeping it simple while still giving all the information is exactly what should be done, but how will, it's gonna be a bit difficult, but I, th I think we can, from the different lessons learned so far, we can maybe focus on certain things and understand clearly what the needs are. Another thing that we will have to struggle with a little bit is this, this right balance between quantitative and qualitative indicators. And as you said, embedding everything in the right context. So it's, it's not just the indicator that matters, it's also whether there is a policy or how does that indicator connect to the rest of the system that is in place. So spot on, that's exactly our, our line of thinking. So it's gonna be great to see how we can advance with some of these uh, issues together. Thank you very, very much again for that, Natalia. Uh, Thomas, you are next. I hope we managed to get your presentation. Yes, perfect, great. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, meeting and I wish you the best of luck to uh, develop this monitoring framework uh, because this, as uh, Natalia said, it's a very difficult task. It's, you um, well, right? <laughs> You're going to be part yeah. of it as well. <laughs> I, uh, I hope I will, and I hope to contribute, and uh, therefore I have pre uh, prepared a presentation that is very concrete. So I want to dig into the details um, on, uh, and share these um, uh, details with you on what we have learned um, on our, you know, our monitoring framework. Um, and uh, so if you go to the next slide, I'll show you them very... Yeah, this is an easy overview of our monitoring framework. So over the past two years, we have developed this and discussed this monitoring framework uh, that will help us in the European Commission and also the member states to, to understand and advance the implementation uh, of policies and practices uh, that are necessary for open science. And it, since uh, I think almost 12 months now, we have really started to discuss and try to implement this. And it is difficult. It's a, a process that needs to be it needs to be long. You have so when you say you have to present the framework in in June, I think it's a very short amount of time. Uh, but uh, let's see if you can get some help from us also. 
So we started very small with the monitoring for EOSC, and, and then we want to expand this to other indicators covering uh, the, the whole spectrum of the science in, in our effort here. And for, for example, also covering other monitoring initiatives, such as the, the monitoring mechanism for the European research area. The overall purpose you see here in the first bullet is, of course, to uh, track uh, the progress towards open science as the new normal, uh, which is one of the general objectives to be achieved before to, uh, 2030 for us. And if we go to the next slide, I think we'll see as a, um, an example of what we have done in, in this EOSC observatory, which is a tool that is um, um, built by Open Air uh, as a beneficiary to the project uh, EOSC Future, which is uh, one of our uh, really big projects um, and very promising. So the, the framework is developed in close collaboration with also expert groups and projects. Uh, and also, the, of course, the EOSC Association. EOSC is the European Open Science Cloud that we build in Europe, um, and um, which uh, we also aim, of course, to be a global asset for, for open science. And uh, we build it along these four layers here in the left um, for, for the monitoring. And a key aspect is really to see the gap between the policies and practices, in particular between the national and the institutional level. The gap analysis uh, opens up for discussions and a lot of mutual learning exercises. So with the monitoring, we want to provide intelligence to support policymaking and dialogue on the implementation issues. We know that there are countries such as uh, you see in this slide, uh, that they have the policies in place, but perhaps not uh, yet uh, the, um, the, at least um, the, they have communicated the practices or, or financial strategies to support the implementation of the practices. Uh, but there are also practices in some countries, like you see in Sweden and Norway, and there that that exist uh, that where they have good examples on how to combine open science elements with key key uh, um, infrastructures for open, uh, for EOSC here in this example. But there are no national uh, policies. Perhaps uh, this is still I say perhaps because this is not a watertight uh, evidence. Uh, this is really something that we work on. It's a work in progress and we collect data. And I'll tell you why we want to show data even though it's not perfect uh, from the very beginning. This is accurate data, of course, validated by the contributors, but uh, it might not show, show the full picture, of course. Um, so the tool I mentioned is, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you for, for going to this one. This is an overview of, of the structure of the indicators for the national and the institutional levels. And to the left, you see the categories of indicators that we, we focus on in, in uh, the, the, the monitoring now. And um, uh, if we can understand the relation between the policies uh, supported or not with financial strategies uh, or instruments, and capture then the progress in practices in the countries uh, among RPOs and RFOs, for example. Then we can start asking new questions on what is happening and what is the effect and impact of a policy for real, or, or what is a possible policy for a country where, where the practices already exist. So all of this, of course, to foster and support the implementation and development of new policies for open science. We combine these quantitative indicators with qualitative survey questions in, in uh, the survey we use. And the survey tool is really the EOSC Observatory and there was a link on the previous slide. So uh, now I will tell you about the lessons learned. I have two slides and then I'm, uh, I will uh, not disturb you anymore. So uh, here are the lesson, one of the lessons learned. I want to tell you about the practical challenge you have, but also some guiding principles that have been super important by all those we have collaborated with in this process. So some practical challenges that are really um, striking is, is uh, of course that uh, we see that in line with what previous projects uh, have said in their landscape analyses, there are huge gaps between the policies and practices. Even though very mature countries that have open science policies in place and they, they also are what really you know, expected to have all the practices in place, we see that the behavior, the, the open science culture among the researchers is not really 
um, uh, following these policies, but rather you keep your story, store your data on local hard drives that you pass along to your friends uh, instead of using the trusted repositories and so on. Uh, also, it's very difficult to translate objectives into indicators. This is something one man really need to spend time on. Uh, and also next step to um, identify survey questions if the survey is what, what you want to use. One other difficulty that we have experienced is, is that um, to answer the survey questions that we have agreed on. For example, we have uh, discussed uh, with 45 countries and uh, expert groups and, and uh, a lot of experts. Um, in, in trying to do something that you know is practically handy for the policymakers and the, the, the institutions. And, and it's a big difference between what you want to know, what you say, this is what I want to know, and this is what we should ask. And then when the same, same uh, institution or person or, or expert wants to answer that question and starts uh, you know, collecting the data from, from the national context, there, it doesn't work sometimes. So you have to really pay attention to, to, uh, to the survey questions and how you develop these. Um, and we have done that in workshops and trainings, and um, we have had, a, uh, we have discussed the elements of, uh, for example, how the financial contributions to EOS can be, what they can look like, what they are, etc. But as soon as you stop collecting the data, you see that this was not how it was organized, the funding streams in, in the country, etc. So training and workshops are not very, have not been super helpful for us actually, because there's a big difference between the theory and the practice. Uh, so what I, I will come to the solution then, but testing is really the, the message here from me. The, some guiding principles that I want to mention is um, to the right in this uh, slide. We have learned that all recent, uh, the, the people and the experts we have talked to, they say that no, not another survey, please. Uh, the burden is uh, awful, so we need to coordinate. So, uh, and this is also what we get help from uh, Open Air with. Uh, so avoid extra surveys, so try to coordinate as long as you can. Of course, that's connected to one of the other bullets there to make the underlying data open so that it can be reused for analysis by other parties uh, elsewhere after the service done, et cetera. So uh, we need to be very open. We focus on bench learning. This is not benchmarking. Uh, so we, we really want to facilitate mutual learning exercises to have uh, one country pick up the phone and call the other country and really learn what are you doing? What, is, what are the success factors on, on your ground and what can we learn from it? And how can I bring it to my community? Uh, also, um, that the, the, ti the timeliness of, of the survey and the reporting. So when you have the data, when you have implemented a, a policy, for example, in your country, you go to the tool and you report it immediately. Um, we see that there is uh, also a gap here. So if you ask for the information one year after, uh, you get another data. And we have seen in several surveys that we have that different, if you also ask the different entities, uh, the survey is delegated to someone in the community, they might answer something different from, from uh, another person in the same country. So this is uh, really important to, to coordinate and be super open uh, with, of course, the survey and the data. Um, broad acceptance of the indicators is uh, crucial, of course, uh, understand the indicators and, and uh, accept them, that this is what we want to be measured on. Uh, this is what we want to tell and that is important, the data must be e easy to reuse for anyone. And uh, we have uh, seen that there's a strong will to avoid uh, uh, proprietary data. Uh, so uh, locked in data that you need to buy, that you cannot share uh, in, 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 to, to a third party, that is something we want to avoid and we need to avoid to be super efficient uh, for the open science monitoring. Um, also, live data. So uh, this, with this, I mean that uh, the annual or biennial reporting is, um, is not so efficient. I, I know that you have to uh, have that sometimes, but um, uh, people lose track. Can I go to the next slide, please? So the second uh, part here, <laughs> I repeat really what, uh, 
to what Natalia said. So keep it simple. It has to be easy to understand. It has to be easy to accept. It has to be um, easy to like. And one, you know, they, those who are monitoring, uh, those who are being monitored, those who are contributing with the data, they all need to feel that this is uh, really meaningful. And um, it's an easy target, of course, for open science because it's super meaningful, right? Uh, anyways, testing in the intended environment. With this, I mean that uh, having a list of indicators in, on a paper and discuss those is one thing, very good. But if you implement them and you start filling in the data in the tool that is the, the real and the live environment, that is another thing. So the testing there must go on and it has to be uh, done again and again. Because only then, we have seen that for each iteration we have in the EOSC Observatory, new questions come to me and this is a problem, we can collect this data, what, what did other people observe this, etc. So what we did was immediately, of course, open up the data that other people put in after an agreement with the 45 countries so that they could see each other's data. Um, interactive dashboards uh, uh, is very important. So if you can see when you have filled in the data, you see how it uh, positions itself with other countries on a map, for example. <coughs> Sorry. That really pushes um, uh, the will and engagement to provide further data. Um, coordinating monitoring, this is also something Natalia mentioned, that it has to be aligned over the different levels. So we focus on international, national, institutional levels. This, um, are important to us and uh, they have to be meaningful together so that the policy makers on national level are really connected with with the institutional level of course there are also other respect uh, things to pay respect to the differences in the different countries organizational uh, challenges and and the language challenges of course well, not challenges but um, um, differences uh, when we look at the national level, we also need to take into consideration the subnational level uh, for in those countries that have federal states. Um, uh, and finally, the monitoring uh, and if you use a survey, it has to be self-explaining. Um, it cannot be a book or handbook uh, uh, somewhere else that people are expected to read from from start to end. The, the tool has to be self-explaining. So thank you so much for this. This is what I wanted to tell you. This is great, um, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, lots of lessons learned, lots of uh, good key messages for us to consider going forward. Uh, and I think there is, again, this idea of simplicity and making it meaningful but relatively simple is something that's going to be critical and that's exactly also what we have uh, what we have heard also from our member states saying we cannot have another huge uh, you know surveys monitors etc uh, so we'll have to figure out what's the best way of simplifying it without losing the gist of the information and without making it over simple that in the end you 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 lose kind of the the, the important parts of the of the information uh, I'm gonna give the floor very quickly to Lauren now. Lauren, we've we've talked uh, um, with your colleagues. We were really kind of interested in this Open Science Indicators project, where PLOS was looking kind of beyond uh, open access, what the impact is in the uh, in the different communities. So, if I can just ask you for a very short, uh, you know, introduction into the Open Science Indicators project of PLOS, that would be very, very useful for us. Sure, I'll just share my uh, screen. I've got a few slides just to kind of illustrate uh, the project. Uh, so I'm Lauren Cadwalder, I'm the Open Research Manager at PLOS, and I want to talk today about uh, an initiative we announced only yesterday, which is uh, Open Science Indicators and the way that we want to monitor open science practices at PLOS. So, uh, for those of you who don't know PLOS, we're um, a non-profit open access publisher and open science is really core cool to our mission. So we've been uh, adding open science features to our suite of journals from 2014 when we launched our mandatory data sharing policy right up to uh, you know, the present day where we're working to push open science forward and in including all sorts of different open science practices. What we're targeting at the moment is to increase uh, adoption of four open science practices. So they're protocols and code, which we uh, think of together as kind of method, so uh, increasing method sharing, 
research data, and whilst we already require research data to be shared, we're now targeting kind of best practice in sharing of research data, so really driving our authors to using repositories rather than supplemental information, and also preprint sharing. And of course, we're uh, pushing for adoption in these, but in order to understand the adoption and whether the uh, different solutions we're implying are being effective or not, we need to be able to monitor what's going on in our published uh, articles and whether our authors are sharing in open science ways. And this is really what's uh, kind of created the Open Science Indicators project that we're just starting now. And that's really looking at how we can measure these practices across all of the plus different journals and going uh, kind of back to kind of 2019 to look at what has changed over the last few years. And we're not just looking at whether the authors are sharing code data preprints protocols, but also actually are they generating it with the acknowledgement that not all open science practices will necessarily apply to all of the research that we publish. So we think it's really important to understand the levels of code sharing, or sorry, code generation, for example, when we're talking about code sharing. So our objectives with this initiative are really to kind of improve our understanding of the researchers that we serve and find better ways to support them. So we are looking at kind of benchmarking, looking at where our researchers have been in their kind of open science uh, adoption journey and looking at the effect that our solutions are having and really kind of interrogating that both at a kind of sub-discipline level as well as a geographical level. So looking at what uh, infrastructure, say different communities use and kind of responding to that accordingly so we can make sure that our solutions really work for them and that we're not employing solutions that only work for a specific subset of our authors. So we're really trying to kind of use these uh, indicators project to create kind of better evidence-based decisions around how we can uh, support and enable authors to uh, adopt open science practices. And we also hope that this project is going to provide reliable information for others to use. So uh, kind of true to our open science mission, we will be sharing this data publicly and we hope that other publishers will, will kind of look at it and learn from it and think about sharing this data about their published output as well and that other uh, people will also find benefit in the data. So as an example, last year we uh, published a preprint on some work we did surveying funders and institutions and asking them about their needs around open science monitoring. And we found that there's a, a lot of concern around open science monitoring and the ability to be able to do that. A lot of uh, funders and institutions would like to do that, but they don't have the tools necessary to do that. And it's not all about compliance either. It's also about identifying kind of gaps or opportunities for training researchers better or looking at the different states uh, of open science adoption between different disciplines, for example, and trying to uh, make sure that we're responding accordingly to where there are both kind of opportunities and examples of good practice, as well as opportunities to bring that level of adoption up. So I just wanted to share a couple of graphs of some, some data that we have. Uh, earlier this year, we did a little pilot study to look at the code sharing uh, rates in PLOS computational biology. We worked with a company called Datasphere, who used uh, natural language processing and an AI driven model to look at code generation and code sharing within the, the published papers of PLOS computational biology. And really this was to look at how effective our policy had been uh, we introduced the mandatory co-chairing policy last March and we wanted to see what kind of effect that had had on the co-chairing rates. And we can see from the graph that uh, up until the policy implementation, we had a very gradual kind of increase in co-chairing. This community was very strong in kind of voluntary co-chairing anyway. And after the policy implementation, that rate of co-chairing really increases as the more papers are published that had to comply with that policy. So this gives us a really good idea of how effective that solution has been for code sharing, but it also shows us the opportunities where we might be able to improve. So do we need to look at our own workflows to enable uh, authors to comply with the code sharing policy, or do we need to do some outreach? Do we need better guidance? And we will continue to monitor these kind of rates and get better ideas of how they're working for the community. So we've decided to extend uh, this work with Datasphere, and uh, this is really the core of our open science indicators 
work and this is um, a graph from the blog that we published yesterday if you can scan the QR code you can go straight to the blog and it just shows a bit of the preliminary data that we're looking at across the whole of the PLOS corpus of journals and that we can see how code sharing and data sharing in a repository has been increasing over time and you know, we can start breaking that down by journal and by ge discipline geographical reason uh, region and looking at how they all differ and the preprint uh, is a currently an estimate and we'll be looking to add the protocols sharing data later in the year and so we hope that this kind of serves as a really good examples of what publishers can do to help uh, with open science monitoring and the type of data that we are able to provide uh, others with uh, so we can all increase open science together and make sure that the monitoring is effective so i'll leave it there thank you very much this is excellent, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you very much. And indeed, that was our, our, our point uh, to, to say, as we were saying, there's lots of actors in the open science arena. Uh, and it's very interesting to see who wants to monitor what and for what purpose. So I think what PLOS is doing now, and it's great that you, I know that you've just launched it and we kind of jumped on the opportunity. Uh, and, and as you were saying, this is something publishers can do to have a look into their own practices in open science. And we already have a question here from Joel saying, please do share this basically with other publishers so that there can be an alignment um, with similar efforts similar efforts done by, by, by the others. So that's maybe something that we can keep as a question for the, for the discussions later on. But we really did want to have a, a feedback from another actor. And, and another point also that I wanted to make at this point is that we have this, these examples in this particular discussion today uh, of um, mainly European-based uh, monitoring frameworks. But the reason is that we had a lot of difficulties in finding monitoring frameworks in other regions, and we stand to be corrected. We know nationally things are happening, but at the regional level, we have not uh, found a monitoring framework uh, so far. So uh, if if anybody knows about others that we should be considering, that would be great. And I know Japan, France here, they're all here. They have done their own monitorings in their countries. Uh, it would be great also in the discussion that will follow if you can bring up some of the lessons learned from your own experiences on um, monitoring from national levels. But before we get into that discussion, I would like to give the floor to Ismail uh, to guide us through a little bit this presentation that we've asked him to do about, you know, the lessons learned uh, and, and more broadly, what are some guiding principles that we should be considering in developing a global uh, monitoring framework for open science? So, okay. Well, thanks uh, for the invitation. Um, what I'm going to share is uh, some reflections after having been part of uh, the European Commission Expert Group on Indicators for Researchers Engaged with Open Science, which we did some five years ago. And uh, I have to share that, that uh, this was not a success of coming up with a specific indicators. Um, the European Commission uh, sort of wanted to have indicators on open science in order to foster the engagement of researchers. And the initial idea was to have a small set of indicators. Um, after engaging with the stakeholders, reflecting on uh, what we have seen in the use of indicators for evaluation, um, we came back saying, well, um, we think that it would be extremely problematic to come up with a narrow set of indicators um, because open science is extremely diverse. Um, and if you only had a small number of indicators using evaluation, this would narrow down the activities that the researchers would do. And also because open science requires resources, and if we had indicators of open science, it would often be co uh, reporting how much resources the researchers would have. So I don't think that, that these conclusions are uh, really, really, readily trans, uh, can be translated to this case, except for the uh, awareness of the need for contextualization. Um, given that uh, we are dealing here with 193 countries with extremely diverse research systems in terms of resources, interest, social, health needs, 
Um, the need for contextualization is something that needs to be kept. Um, in here, let me start um, by thinking about this broader monitoring system by uh, this uh, small quote that if, the came, if indicators are the answer, what is the question? What is it that we are trying to achieve? We're trying to foster open science according to the UNESCO values and principles. And uh, in the case of the UNESCO open science recommendation, we don't have to, we have to first of all remember that the values go beyond uh, the technical issue, uh, the, the, the more uh, scientific issues. So on the one hand, uh, there is quality and integrity, but the core values of the open science according to the UNESCO uh, recommendation are about science for a collective benefit, about a science that is equitable and fair and that it's diverse and inclusive. And this means not just looking at whether the activities of science are open in the sense of you know, sharing, but also if they allow spaces for the different languages that we have across the world to be present in science, for different types of communities to participate of science, for different ethnic groups participating in science, uh, for having gender equity, and for science leading to um, benefits of humankind. And this normative dimension uh, makes, I am going to claim that these normative dimensions makes this exercise at the UNESCO level um, more complex than maybe than the exercises that we have been thinking at, at the European uh, level. Um, and one of the key principles that I think is relevant is this principle of flexibility. So I'm quoting literally the recommendation. And the recommendation says that given the diversity of science systems, and there are different dynamics. There is no one size fits all way of practicing open science. Um, indicators are always measuring a system according to a given set of classes. But if these systems differ, you will need different indicators. So I, my proposal is that while we can build partly on traditional statistics. In this case, we should go beyond traditional statistics in having flexibility. Um, and I'm trying to make the, the, the argument about the, the flexibility and contextualization been extremely important because um, I'll claim that we have two types of activities uh, that we are going to measure. On the one hand, well, according to this uh, UNESCO framework, you have the open scientific knowledge and open infrastructures, which are outputs that might be counted. But in the case of open science, these outputs are not like publications that are quite standardizable, but we have objects such as databases or educational resources in which the qualities of these objects are extremely important. So research databases, which have um, extensive meta data are arguably more valuable than uh, non-fair, compliable um, research databases. Educational resources would differ in their relative value according whether they are filling gaps in terms of language, in terms of gender perspective, in terms of ethnic uh, coverage. Um, and in, the, in, in terms of uh, publications, uh, we have a huge problem in that the databases that we have are very biased towards the global north. So we are going to miss many of the 193 countries if we stick with the mainstream databases. So this is for the outputs. 
But I will argue that one of the issues that it's more difficult uh, in mapping, measuring, it's these two other aspects of open science, which is the open engagement with societal actors and open dialogue. Here we are talking not about outputs of research within the research system, but about processes in which researchers interact with citizens, with volunteers, and with organizations. And um, in the case of the dialogue with other knowledge systems, in context that are not easily traceable in local communities, indigenous people, or marginalized scholars. And I think that in those cases, it's very uh, difficult to get the data unless you do surveys. Um, and then um, the other argument for contextualization is that we want to have uh, this mapping of uh, outputs and processes painted by, painted or analyzed according to these lenses of what is the collective benefit uh, that they produce that, what is the social returns of research, and um, what is the ethnic or gender or cultural uh, specific contribution that fills gaps, what is uh, the contribution that it's making in terms of topic diversity, in terms of bibliodiversity, in terms of linguistic diversity, which are issues highlighted by the recommendation. Um, so we need to have indicators that, that qualify the scientific activities according to these values. So I propose uh, that in these monitoring frameworks, we should keep in mind uh, the need for flexibility. Different countries might have different reporting because there is no one size fits all. The importance of the qualities of the outputs and the processes and the values. And therefore, counting items is, is not enough. It is, it is uh, very useful having the number of open access publications, number of uh, or, uh, articles with uh, sharing uh, uh, data sources, or but um, we need to go beyond this because we know from previous um, use of indicators that if we are using too narrow indicators, this is counterproductive in terms that the effect on the actors which are measuring which are measured is to narrow uh, their activities. So uh, to finish, I propose uh, having a pluralistic monitoring system, which follows from this principle of flexibility, which is explicitly mentioned in the recommendation. And then in this pluralistic view, um, coming up with different ways of getting information, which is something that we have already seen in the previous presentation. So in the type of output analysis uh, presented uh, initially by Natalia Manola, it is uh, very important to have a global scientific scholarly databases that allow us to analyze the diversity, issues about diversity, which is one of the values um, emphasized by the recommendation. There is the possibility of doing surveys to research organizations because surveys are a means of having information on processes. And here I would refer to the move that the OECD did from um, the 
Frascati manual that was developed in the 60s to the Oslo manual that was developed in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, with the Oslo manual for innovation being a survey that asks about interactions. So the same way, if we are interested in the part of open science that relates to collaboration with society, I am afraid that serve, that surveys to um, organizations are um, the more direct way of getting the information. As um, the European Commission was telling us, then there is the reporting on policies. And finally, I, I would not be hard having as well opinion service to experts and thinking that subjective judgments can also give us insights into more controversial issues such as the benefits of research uh, in terms of societal impact. So uh, to conclude, uh, I, I, I understand that I'm making things complicated. Um, but we'll try to keep things simple. If we want to be true to this commitment to diversity, to epistemic justice, we will need to keep flexibility and being able to, to paint a picture with a variety of colors. Thanks for the attention. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ismail. Uh, that's a, a, a lot of food for thought, uh, a bit of a different perspective, a different lens. Uh, it's, it's really, really interesting, your, your presentation. And I really think that there's lots of things that we can take from there. And we do hope that you will be there also to help us, <laughs> uh, getting these things done because it's not necessarily, uh, very easy or straightforward, but I, I would like to open up now for a discussion. You can pose questions to our speakers or comments with regards to what they have presented. Um, please feel free to raise your hands. Uh, please feel free to um, to put your comments in the in the um, uh, in the chat if you prefer. Um, I think there was a, again a lot of food for thought from all of our speakers uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to your comments as well. Jack Nunn, please. the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, really interesting and very inspiring. Um, I am one of the co-chairs of the Community Practice for Open Science and Citizen Science and um, a few other things. But I just wanted to say that the Open Science Monitoring Framework, in my opinion, needs to take into account the limits of the word science and ensure it can work with other disciplines. So work even beyond science to domains, including education, uh, policy, manufacturing, international development, et cetera. Um, so I think just making sure that whatever we're doing is a monitoring framework that works with other kinds of monitoring frameworks beyond science. Um, so that's my first sort of thing to throw out there as a discussion. I also think we need to make sure that we have transparent ways of mapping the different values and different interests, interests in, in the sort of technical sense, um, including the competing or conflicting interests of different stakeholders so that these can be appraised alongside the data. Um, I probably don't need to give examples, but an obvious one, of course, would be, you know, open science funded by a tobacco industry, for example. You can probably see where I'm going with this. Um, you know, making sure that that data layer is there alongside uh, other data layers. Uh, and, and finally, just to say, um, I've been involved with a project called Standardized Data on Initiatives, or Start It for short, which can be used to report and monitor this kind of data. And it's open and it works in Wikidata and across multiple languages. Um, and, you know, designed to be interoperable with many of the kinds of projects here. So, uh, but thank you to everybody. I'll put what I said in the chat and um, thanks uh, for, for convening us and I'll finish there. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jack, very much. Uh, 
another layer of complexity to what to, we, we we need to do. Uh, and I, I entirely agree. I, I do think that our biggest challenge will be to be able to do something within the framework of time that we have for 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 now that is uh, that is realistic but i do think that whatever monitoring framework we do come up with needs to be flexible and changeable and uh, ev can evolve in time because there is going to be a lot of additional things that we will be learning and uh, and it and it would be good to be able to make the changes as we learn more and as there are more tools that allow us to look into some of these issues as as Jack was saying, going beyond science um, as well. Um, Marin, you wanted to share a little bit from the experience of the French national monitoring system. I think people would be very interested to hear uh, what you have done and and how this could relate to a possibly a global monitoring system. Again, what have you learned that can be useful in in our case now? Thank you. So I will very will be very quick. So I have given a, a link to our National Open Science Monitor in the chat. So if you want to have a look to to the monitor itself, you, you can have a look uh, while I this present. So we have built our Open Science Monitor step by step. So it's very difficult to 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 start from scratch and to create a whole big monitoring system com completely comprehensive. So we decided to, to build it layer after layer, uh, starting by publications, which is most, uh, sim most simple. And then we added clinical trials, which is very important, which is discipline oriented. And now we are working on data and code, and it's very difficult, but we, we will provide a new uh, generation of our Open Science Monitor next year uh, with data and code. And of course, we update the information concerning publications and clinical trials uh, each year. And we will plan to add more layers of complexity of information that we want to focus on. So it's it's a process. It's not a one shot, uh, uh, fully uh, achieved uh, monitoring. Uh, it's a process. Uh, what we know now is that it's that it's possible to build an open science monitor without any proprietary data. So without mm -hmm. any information coming from Web of Science and from Frapscopis, we use only open data. And that's very important. And I have heard that many people say we need that. And if non, not only we need that, but we can do without uh, closed data or proprietary data. So it's very important. The other lesson, lesson is that the data quality is key. So uh, it has to be checked. If you want to have a good data quality, uh, it has to be checked locally at the country or region or institution level. We, we cannot uh, be too fast to provide metrics or indicators that could include many mistakes because we are coming from the sky, <laughs> seeing the things too, too, from two eyes. So it's difficult to have a, a feedback system. Uh, so we will build this one with each institution in France, which is starting its own monitoring with our data and then they check and they validate the data. The other feedback that I can share with you is that machine learning and deep learning has made so many progresses last years that we can benefit from it. It's very different from 10 years ago, and uh, it's, it's making a lot of progresses. And so it, it's a very good time to, to, to do uh, this kind of monitoring. And we have many new tools that uh, nobody has already um, evoked the name like an paywall open alex will be that will be decisive in the next years because we can rely on this kind of already existing tools which are fully open good quality methodology and so on and so we we can build upon on the top of it two last points and then i will have finished uh, of course we cannot monitor hidden, hidden things or even if information is public, we have a lack of uh, PIDs. So when we don't, cannot identify uniquely a, a, an object, it's very difficult to interconnect to content and so on. We can have redundancy, we can have issues and so on. So the PID, permanent ID policies and PID implementation is a key to success, especially 
for the borders of the system. The STM publications have already PIDs and that's okay. But HSS, humanities and social sciences publications has less DOIs, softwares has, has less PIDs and so on. So if you want to be inclusive, we, we need to have stronger PID policies and not only policies, but implementation of the policy. And then if I, I want to conclude the main message is that we started our open science monitoring in 2018. At the same year, we started our first national open science plan. And the monitoring has been instrumental from, from the beginning to implement and to advance uh, the open science policy. So it, it, it has been a very strong tool at local and national level to make open science more uh, visible, more comprehensive. And so it, it was open science monitoring was very key to advance our policy and it was useful to, to build the, the second national open science plan, for example. So it's, it's very, it's not a secondary project. It's a, a central project from the open science policies that we need. Of course, if the tool is lying because the tool is done too quickly or badly, it's worse than nothing, okay? But if the, the tool is, is, is built carefully and gains trust, then it will be instrumental. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mara. And I saw um, a, a couple of questions uh, for you also in the in the chat. Uh, very interesting. So, J Joe, um, would you like to, I, I think this question about, you know, there are tracking tools. Most of them actually do focus on open access. What are the, the systems to track other aspects of open science? Uh, have you been thinking about that? And Joe, maybe you want to elaborate a little bit on this uh, uh, on this question, Joe Haveman. Yeah, thank you. I really don't want to take up much time and space in this regard. And I know it's really difficult to track other aspects of open science effectively and efficiently. But I see a few responses coming in and there is a few approaches by like-minded organizations like those represented in this call. Um, yeah, and then as of Dora, well, it's also mostly about publications, but, but also looking at other aspects. So I think at the end of the day, open access is really the strongest pulling horse for indicators. Um, and also like, um, how can we make sure not to make this a competition that might um, fire back and create tension and competition amongst the research communities around the world. And it was already mentioned that with the indicators being established, um, countries in Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia might not be able to keep pace if, despite the opportunities. This is also being discussed in, uh, in certain fora, like how open science, not, not, with all these like, um, promising initiatives and activities um, taking shape, but how can we make this really globally inclusive and not leave anyone behind as what's the theme of UNESCO Open Science just a couple of years yeah. ago and I think ongoing. So yeah, this, this were just a few thoughts and um, triggers. And I'm sure there's there's a lot of expertise, not only in this room, but also in the wider working groups um, arena. And thanks for facilitating all of these discussions. That's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. So if there is anything, anybody, Maran, uh, Natalia, uh, Thomas, or, or Lauren, others who have been thinking about tracking other aspects uh, of, of course, open science, that's, that's definitely something that will be coming into play. But there is also this nice conversation going on here in the chat about the usefulness or not of a possible open science index uh, for countries that would kind of... Uh, put the countries together and we try to see who, where, where they are. That's also something to, um, to think about uh, maybe as we are having these discussions uh, further down in the future. Uh, Maran, do you want to respond? And then I'll give the floor to Lauren or, yeah, thanks. Okay, <clears throat> so there are many questions. So yeah. uh, the first thing is that to say is that if, if, if people want to discuss directly with uh, Eric, which is online with me, to discuss about the question of methodology, it's open, and the methodology is also published in an uh, article that Eric will provide the, 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 the link to the methodology which is public. 
Of course, it's simpler to, to get uh, open access uh, monitoring. So we started with that mm -hmm. and we used only cross ref information and non paywall information. So what, we didn't use lens. For example, someone someone's asked about lens. And uh, for the others, um, layers, of course, we, it's not the same thing. So we used uh, the clinicaltrials.org platform to, to, to get information about the um, clinical trials. And we will have a, a, an access next, next month is in the list of authorized clinical trials in France. So we, we need different uh, layers of, uh, of information. So the publication is not the, the key, but if you want to know more deeply where our data and how they are used and where is the code, there are two ways of doing this. We can start from the repositories or we can start from the publication. So we, we think that starting from the publication and trying to, to, uh, to and we uh, trying to, to say, see where the data is quoted and where is linked, it's interesting. And the plus is using the same technology as an S for that. And it's a French technology created by a French researcher. So it's interesting to see that we are converging and that's very interesting. And of course, and I finish there, we, are, we have a tendency to forget the question and to focus on the data availability. So first of all, always um, we need to know what we try to achieve and then try to, to, to create a monitoring tool that could mm -hmm. uh, address the question. But of course, it, it, it's very complex. Most, most of the time, we, we should avoid to make measure or to, to create metrics only on metrics capable information. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mara. And that's uh, kind of the discussion we had uh, internally also, because th there is the tendency, like you just you want to go there where the information is and it's going to be easier, but that's not the point, right? So we have to kind of also, again, another balance to, 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 to take into account, focus on the questions and, and, and get the answers in whatever way you can get the answers to some of these key questions um, also. Uh, Lauren, you had a, a response, please. Yeah, there I were just some want... questions for you in the chat as well, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to make a couple of points. First of all, uh, I wanted to address the issue of uh, the idea of an index or kind of ranking um, countries on open science practices. It's something we're trying to definitely steer away from at PLOS with our open science indicators work. We're very clear that this is not about ranking anyone's performance. Uh, you know, the publishing industry is full of metrics and people trying to gain them and use them to, to demonstrate something that's not, the metric doesn't necessarily show. Um, Instead, I think, especially in our open science team, we like to think about kind of assets and needs and which, which countries or communities or areas are doing really well and what we can learn from and kind of work with to, to improve practice and where are there are opportunities to support and, and enable people instead. Um, I just wanted to address Joe's question on kind of sharing this with publishers. We are, as part of this project, um, doing a kind of small comparison group of uh, research published in other areas so we can put PLOS kind of in context of the wider scholarly landscape to show uh, how we're doing in terms of kind of our more open science focused publishing efforts and our uh, policy driven approach or, or some of our kind of infrastructure enabled approaches and we can look at how communities respond to that compared to how they respond to open science practices in, in journals where there aren't these policies so we can get a better idea and we hope that by sharing that data as well, it will give publishers the kind of impetus to go away and look at their own practices in more detail, uh, and then hopefully share that uh, more widely as well. Uh, there was another point I was going to make. Oh, uh, the final point I wanted to make was just about the uh, the need for flexibility around open science, like Ishmael was talking about. Uh, one of the things we've been learning through this project is that actually it's really complex to even measure something like code sharing. Um, and, and data sharing, you know, like where, how do you track things? Do you look for URLs? Do you look for DOIs? You know, there are repositories like GenBank that only issue accession numbers. And when you think about stuff like data, uh, code sharing, and kind of what counts as code that should be shared, 
you know, there are various systems that use code, but you actually use a different uh, kind of friendly user interface, so you're not directly typing into the command line. How do all of these things kind of count and interact uh, to, to kind of create a definition around code sharing? And, and it is very difficult and things like protocols make it even more difficult when you think about method sharing. So I think there's a lot of nuance around open science monitoring um, and that hopefully they, we can come to kind of some shared agreement around it and how to measure it. Um, we've certainly been building or data have working with have been building off already published uh, methodologies for measuring open science. So uh, and, you know, we'll be kind of uh, sharing details of that in due course. So hopefully we can kind of converge these efforts like Marin said. That's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And th this is already part of our discussion on the broader monitoring framework. So I'm 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 not cutting this short because it's uh, it 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 already goes into the the next uh, point on our on 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 our agenda. But just to focus our discussions a little bit, I'm I'm going to give the floor to uh, Ferishte Rafayan from UNESCO from our team. Uh, who will just, you know, present to you very quickly uh, what do we have uh, in terms of monitoring uh, provisions in the recommendation and also to remind us that the recommendations has these seven areas of action that I've, uh, I've presented briefly before and there is also the need to bring the conversation around monitoring of the implementation of the recommendation on those areas of action. So that's, again, an, another lens or another way that we will have to approach um, this monitoring framework. But so, so just for you to, to, to keep in mind. And, uh, and in the meantime, please, uh, Ferry, if you can just, you know, guide us through uh, monitoring in the implementation, uh, monitoring the implementation of the UNESCO recommendation on open science with the provisions from uh, from the recommendation. Yes, sure. Thanks, Anna, and thanks uh, all the great speakers and colleagues for sharing your very valuable experiences and realistic point of views. It's very useful for us. Uh, so yes, I will walk us through the provisions that the recommendation itself provides for guiding the member states in monitoring their policy and mechanisms related to open science. So um, by, by uh, using both quantitative and qualitative, qualitative approaches. And of course, the monitoring of member states should be in, uh, in line with their specific conditions, their governing structures and constitutional provisions. So the text of the recommendation uh, encourages the member states to uh, deploy monitoring uh, mechanisms that allows them to measure the efficiency and uh, effectiveness of open science policy in incentives that they have to achieve the objectives of this recommendation. And this should not just cover the positive progress, it should also try to include and indicate uh, the unintended consequences and potential negative effects that these open science policy and practices can have, especially on the early career researchers in the countries. So for monitoring um, the progress, it like collecting and sharing the progress and good practices in the countries at different levels and innovation and research reports would be very useful. And uh, in this, UNESCO is, of course, committed to support the member states in a multi-stakeholder approach. And that's why, for example, we have already launched the, the call for best practices in open science. And we encourage you and your national networks to contribute to that. So the recommendation, the recommendation also encourages developing a monitoring framework uh, with quantitative and qualitative indicators uh, within the national strategic plan, uh, with, uh, which addresses the objectives and actions uh, that countries are designing for implementation of the recommendation in short term, medium term and long term. So in this way, the development of the national implementation plan and the monitoring framework would go hand in hand. Um, and of course, uh, when thinking about uh, strategies to monitor uh, the recommendation, we should think about the long term efficiency of open science. And uh, we should address the link or we should 
try to um, strengthen the link between science policy and society. And you should think of in the concept of a science that is um, accountable, it is inclusive, it has high quality and it, it's uh, equitable for everyone. And it's a science that can address our global challenges. An important point that the member states have uh, included in this is that the monitoring of uh, the progress of uh, the implementation of the recommendation and the open science should be explicitly kept under the public oversight. And it should include scientific community and whenever it's possible, it should be supported by open infrastructures. Uh, of course, the monitoring can be assisted by the private sector, but it cannot be completely delegated to them. Um, so beside these provisions of the recommendation, there are guiding principles as colleagues perfectly and in detail discussed. Uh, um, from UNESCO side, for example, we need to consider the synergies and overlaps between this recommendation and other relevant recommendations of UNESCO, for example, the 2017 recommendation on scientific research and scientific science and scientific researchers or the 2019 recommendation on open educational resources in, in order to to minimize the burden of monitoring and reporting and uh, harmonize also so we can we can take the input uh, uh, or output of the monitoring to broader analysis at the global or national level. We should also encourage and facilitate uh, the use of available relevant indicators and data sources. For example, the existing uh, UNESCO Global Observatory for STI policies or relevant UN SDG indicators or the indicators that the EU Commission and OECD have been developing, and also indicators used on other open science platforms and in other regions. Um, and of course, an important part of the process of uh, developing this framework, as colleagues also discussed, is proper consultation with national focal points and actors to identify what kind of data is already collected at the national level and what can be collected. Uh, so we can consider this when designing our, uh, our indicators. And of course, this list is already a lot bigger with the great inputs that we received from uh, colleagues and we count on you for more inputs to complete this. And with this, I will pass the floor to Anna to open the discussion again for the points that may have been remained. Thank you very much in advance for your input. Great, thanks. So a, a very, I'm sorry, um, I'll just share the screen, the, the, the I can do that for you. Two questions that we had uh, proposed uh, for the discussion. Here we go. Um, so, um, this is so the, the way we saw this first meeting is really to present what is already out there what are the key issues that we have to be thinking about and also what is there in the recommendation and what are some of the limits or some of the structures or some of the the, the factors that we and the secretariat also need to take into um, account when we are uh, the, developing this 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 framework and also the reporting for 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 member states so in, in the remaining 10, 15 minutes, um, we would be very happy to hear from you. Um, you know, uh, if you have any additional ideas on some other guiding principles for a global monitoring framework, uh, how to ensure some harmonization of the reporting, uh, how do we include, I mean, these are national reportings that we are talking about when it comes to the um, UNESCO uh, reporting back on the implementation of the UNESCO recommendation, but how do we get inputs from uh, other stakeholders? Uh, how do we get inputs on multi-stakeholder collaborations? Um, what are some other possibly existing approaches for monitoring open science practices, processes, actors, etc.? So um, any other guidance at this stage or feedback on this stage uh, at this stage from your side would be very very useful uh, for us to start thinking about a first kind of 
frame draft of the of the of the framework for open open science. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and open the floor one more time for um, any additional comments that colleagues may have um, at this stage. Anything else? Jack, I see that you had posted something um, in response to as a feedback. Um, just to say that I think, you know, it should be multilingual, which is perhaps obvious, but it's very easy to make an assumption that working in English works. Yeah. Um, and it does if you speak English, doesn't it? Um, and speaking as an English person, that's easy to forget. So something that uses a form of structured data that has like something like wiki data for example that sits as is almost concepts which different languages can work into and can, can be co-created i think is a really good example of something that already exists and could be worked with it's you know but i'll leave it there great thank you thank you very much neil did you want to share uh your thoughts Neil Jacobs, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know that there is a lot of good work. Um, yeah, no, thank you. So I yeah. couldn't find the mute button and plug my headphones in and that sort of thing. Yeah, I was just pointing out a couple of things in the chat there. Um, there's some really good work being started at the Global Research Council on research assessment. And there is a relationship, I think, here between research assessment and the sorts of indicators that you're thinking of developing. They're not the same thing, um, but I think there is a relationship that could be could be um, set out and made clear. Uh, and I just pointed to some guiding principles in a UK report, the metric tide about the use of indicators and, and how if they are reflexive and have some humility and are flexible, that really helps uh, address some of the, the limitations. Um, while I'm here, so can I put a slightly controversial point, which was a, I was about to write in the chat, but I'll put it here, which is you said, uh, well, Freshte, I think, said that the national bodies are going to develop their own monitoring frameworks or are invited to do so within their implementation plans. Would it not be more, if I've understood that correctly, and I may not have done, but if that's the case, would it be worth waiting to see what those look like in, in all their diversity um, before we really set on the task of an overall framework? We, uh, Ferry, do you want to go or? Uh... You can go. I think we have the same point. <laughs> so the, the, the thing is that we have an obligation um, procedurally uh, because this is a legal instrument adopted by the member states. So procedurally, we have an obligation. There is a timeline that we have to, um, that we have to uh, abide, uh, you know, you, we, ha we have to uh, keep in mind. Uh, and, and, and there is this first reports that have to come from member states uh, four years after the adoption, two years after the adoption, we have to propose to them a possible survey that they will then use to start reporting, et cetera. That survey can be changed and we can work with those surveys and change them based also on what is happening at the national level. So it's it's kind of in in these unesco recommendations not just unesco in global recommendations in general some countries as we heard france japan other countries they already have their monitoring systems uh and what we are trying to do is to see how much of those can can be kind of integrated into what we are doing uh but there is a lot that don't and they will not for a while so basically they are waiting for UNESCO to come up with something which will then guide them towards their own national monitoring system because they have to report back to UNESCO. So it's a bit of a, uh, a, a, a different way of doing things. But at the same time, that does not mean that we should not be making sure that we are keeping track of what is happening in different countries and if that's very different from what we have initially proposed so yes I mean it would be great if we could wait uh, but I don't think that that's just you know procedurally that's not the way we can do it and then I'm not sure that you know waiting would we would have to wait for a while particularly for some some countries some parts of the world yeah. Um, can I add something here? Sure. 
So it's also important to consider that although there are overlaps and what is interesting to look at at the global and national level, as different countries have different conditions, they may decide to implement open science differently. And then there is a need for an independent monitoring framework for what happens inside the countries. And that can contribute, part, part of that can contribute to the global framework. Exactly, yeah. Uh, Ismail, please, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks. So I have a question regarding uh, the monitoring. So while I understand about uh, the need for a national monitoring, I would like to ask as well where it makes sense having some global monitoring that might be conducted or by UNESCO or some of the organizations related, which would... Um, for example, report on global trends on linguistic diversity, on um, topics uh, that become more important, less important, etc. We great, great question. So uh, it kind of goes a little bit beyond reporting or monitoring open science nationally in th th this context. One thing that we would like to do uh, as we move on is we have this idea of an open science outlook, which would be this global publication that looks into trends, status and trends of open science in all of its different dimensions. So what you were talking about, the linguistic diversity in scientific publishing or something like that could be part indeed of that open science outlook that we would um, that we would like to produce and for that we need some data first from the countries we have to figure out you know also internally how that would how that would work work like but we are thinking you know the there is this global education monitoring report that comes out and that's exactly where what, what the idea is like what are some of the trends in education that we can monitor across the world and where we can see what is uh, what is happening beyond um reporting on the implementation of the of the recommendation hope that responds to the to the question and and i mean the the two would have to match uh in in a way uh but they can also be be, be different because some things we don't necessarily need to collect from countries uh, directly great Okay, well, if if there is no other contributions, I'm looking a little bit at the um, at the chat, uh, and I'm looking at the hands. I don't see any hands anymore. Maybe just a, a few words on what we think the next steps could be, um, and how we can continue this the, the this this conversation. Again, let me just uh, share my. Green. Sorry. Here we go. So, um, based on these questions that we have put uh, in the chat, and we'll share with you by email as well. If there is any additional comment that you want to make, if you want to think about it a little bit more, if you want to just, you know, gather your thoughts, send us your inputs, um, it would be great if you could do so uh, on openscience at unesco.org by 25th of September, so in the next 10 days or so. We will then start, we started already, but we really needed this conversation to understand a little bit what the general feeling is uh, for a draft monitoring framework that we would get done by more or less the 10th of October, share with the group and get your comments by the 25th of October. And then gather everybody again together on the 15th of November for the second meeting of the group to look into precisely this draft monitoring framework, what people are thinking, is it going in the right direction? Is it something that we should completely uh, change? It will not be a final version of it. It will just be the contour of, of, of what we will then develop further. But I think between now and the 15th of November, with your different inputs in these different moments, uh, we would be able to come up with something that we can share with you and that we could discuss uh, at the next meeting in November 2022. 
Then for some of you know, some of you are not aware yet, we are going to have an Open Science Day uh, at the World Science Forum in South Africa. And we will be taking some of these um, drafts, some of these issues also to discuss with the audience that will be there. Uh, everybody, of course, will be invited. Um, we're still looking into whether or not it's going to be hybrid, hoping it will be. If not, everybody, of course, is invited in, in Cape Town. So that, that's another place where we will be able to continue the discussions on the monitoring framework. And then we will pick it up again in the beginning of next year, knowing that kind of our deadline is um, more or less around June next year, because we also need to get some feedbacks from, from our member states before we actually propose it to uh, to them in the consultations that we, again, procedurally have to do with them on this as well. So if, if that's okay for everybody, this is the way we would like to uh, proceed. Um, I don't think, um, I don't think I see, yeah, good. It's good to see the, the thumbs up. So great. So this is what we will do um, on our side. Um, just send you the questions again today. So you see what we are kind of looking for. Send us your inputs by 25th of September. We'll share the draft 10th, get your inputs back, comments by 25th or a little bit later, and then have another meeting. Please mark it in your calendars on the 15th um, of November. Uh, another thing just for you to remember, particularly those who are in, involved in several working groups, the next one is on the 20th of September next week on open science funding and incentives, and we will be sharing a draft document with you uh, between today and uh, and the end of the week. Um, 26 September capacity building. We have some nice um, deliverables coming up from the different inputs uh, for that working group as well. And then open science infrastructures on 30th of September. We apologize for all these different meetings in such a short period of time. We will try to keep the meetings uh, short um, and, and really to the point, but we really did want to kind of gather uh, all these different working groups before the end of September so that we have some time to work on it um, before also in preparation for this World Science Forum to get the draft out as much as possible. So, um, uh any links to public uh, that you sorry jack would you like to ask your question <laughs> well, the... just basically you're asking for feedback do you have a url that we can share with our networks where the information is that, that you want feedback on if you see what we, I'm saying. we are not we are not there yet so for the okay. moment we really ask feedback from the working group if you then want to go and send the same email to your networks you you're more than welcome to do that, that. But for the moment, we'll get these inputs, feedbacks from the from the working group. And then once we start sharing the documents, there is going to be a moment where these documents are mature enough to go to a wider um, audience as well. Uh, and everybody, of course, is is free to share with their communities for inputs while you're giving us uh, your feedbacks back um, back to us here in the Secretariat. Hope that works. Uh, for everybody so that we don't have too many reiterations of these documents out there uh, then people get confused and we really have to see at which moment the documents are mature enough to go out um, to then be commented on by the entire community so we've got okay. immature documents at the moment exactly exactly <laughs> thank you okay all right so if if there are no more questions or comments. I'm gonna ask the team also, Ferry and uh, Tiffany, um, if there is anything else that you would like to maybe share with the group. No, uh, all is good. We will be in touch via email and we look forward for your input. Okay, yeah. that sounds good. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. We are looking forward to your inputs and to continuing this, uh, this conversation with you all.